So just for both of our audiences, for whoever doesn't know, super excited to have Bullet Holes in the Bible here today. I'm Daniela Mestinek young I'm a scholar of cults, extreme groups, and extremely bad leadership. And I have a lot in common with you, I believe. Yeah, you do, um, you do. I first came across uh, one of your videos and you were talking about hair control. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how I, I got, okay, you have this evangelical background, you really know your Bible, like deconstruction <laughs> stuff, great. And then I'd seen like a few videos and then I came across you mentioning military experience and I was like, okay, no way. Like this is now <laughs> like the perfect person who's, who's really gonna get this. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just like tell us about you and your hair? Um, oh my <laughs> and, and hair control, and and, and well, just like, yeah, but, let, let's just so honestly, start talking about coercive groups with hair control. Um, how do you think like hair, you know, specifically growing it out, has like contributed to your identity? Um, you know, one of the yeah, things yeah. I come across a lot as a cult scholar is people that want to control you that are mm -hmm. doing what we call appearance policing, uh, which. Yeah. Is we have both in the military and in your more traditional cults, they will focus on four things always, which is hair, uh, body coverage, body size, and underwear. Um, mm -hmm. You know, really interesting things from both the military. Like I always, when I'm talking to men that want to join the military, I will tell them my recommendation to you is three weeks before you go, go into a bathroom and shave your own head. Because that moment when they take your hair from you is like, it's a really important part of them breaking you down. Mm -hmm. um, and I have very interesting thoughts about like why and how it doesn't, you know, work for women well, and, and what that means for us. But, oh, yeah. you know, hair as an important part of identity. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, like seriously, because even when I was in the Marine Corps and I was for 13 years, I, I kind of like fought the hair police the whole time I was in. And that was, we're, we're talking about fighting over half an inch here or like for the Marine Corps, it had to be faded to zero, you know, and it has to gradually fade up to no longer than three inches on top. And so, but based on the actual textbook manuals, that fade could be really low just around your ear and the bottom of your, your scalp line, but they don't want you to do that there's like this hidden additional, you know, you need more flair standard of like, if you're a higher rank and you like take the Marine Corps more seriously, then you should have a higher, you know, fade, a higher rank, shorter hair. You should look more aggressive and more like disciplined. And my attempts to even have just a little bit of identity with three inches of hair on top and a lower fade. So I, so that I would look more normal, you know, I didn't look as Marine-ish when I was like out in town on the weekends and that's what I wanted because to me, like even in boot camp and all through my whole career, I always had this like deep desire to maintain my individuality. And that's, and it caused me to clash with people my entire career. But literally like as soon as I got out, you know, I was like, and actually I, I kept it short for a couple of years after I got out, but because at first when I started growing it out, it got poofy and ugly. And I thought this is not going to be good. I didn't know what to do with it. So I just kept it short for a few more years. But really like a big part of me growing it out now is that partially it's this sort of subconscious, like getting back at my mom and dad in the Marine Corps for never allowing me to grow it out my entire life, even though I begged and begged, especially when I was a kid, I begged to grow my hair and they never would let me try. Not even, it just looked too, they thought it was too like, you know, um, androgynous or something, not, mm -hmm. not like not Roman enough or whatever. So I totally get that. And for me, like my hair being long now, like says a lot. I think people understand my real personality better than they did when my hair was short. I think that when my hair was short and I looked more aggressive and more like, you know, like Marine, people would always be super surprised when they found out how laid back and chill I am and how forgiving and like flexible I am with, with things. But I think now people approach me and they kind of assume that about me right off the top. And yeah. I like that because they're actually right. Like, I think people get a better read on me now than they used to. So it's it's really interesting. And I'm really kind of, you know, hoping to look at this for, for my next book I'm writing called The Culting of America, which is, you know, this control. 
you know, and I, I really look at it around women, of course, I have my, so I have this concept called the skinny white woman, which is just, you know, the same thing as outside of cults, we have white women upholding the patriarchy inside cults, we have these white women that are right next to the leader, and they are basically the ultimate follower, you know, and your job is to be skinny and quiet in a light shade of beige. And basically anything that you do, in your case, being a dude with long hair that you just wear down and natural, it's almost like it is a satellite, you know, or telegraphing to the audience that you are not, you're not playing the game, you know, right. you're not playing the patriarchy game. And the right. patriarchy really, really is invested in the separation of men and women, gender roles, men versus women. Um, and, you know, so something even interesting, like for me in the military was, well, you know, they take your hair on the first day, but they don't take our hair. So already from day one in the military, mm -hmm. where your job is to not stand out, your primary job in the military is not to stand out. Mm -hmm. And of course, as women, we do, um, you know, and even in our regulations in the army, even where you could have like a pixie cut or like technic, there was all of these regulations about how like you couldn't have like a men's haircut, mm -hmm. um, you know? And so then people will want to flip that and they'll be like, okay, fine. So take all the women's hair. Well, that's not equal either, you know, because where you were talking about how like you just wanted like a few more inches on your hair so that you didn't look so military Mm -hmm. When you are in the out out group, the larger right. group, you know, as right. women, I guess that's the one benefit we have is we can let our hair down and walk away yeah. from soldier time and just be, you know, normal members of the population. If you were to right. force us into these extreme hairstyles, then we would like Stand not fit in, yeah, yeah, with mm -hmm. the out group and in in a, like an even more judged way. So there's not really winning here um mm -hmm. and of course you know this hair control like it is not just in extreme groups like we see this of course every branch of the military um but we also see this just just weaponized in the workplace right the concept mm -hmm. of professionalism i you know talk about a lot that part of why i wrote uncultured was for the men that fit the perfect you know, white, blonde, blue eyed, six foot tall, like perfect ideology or idea of what a soldier is and what the military is made for to understand like how different it is when you are a few steps away. And when you really look at military regulations with a critical eye, in my opinion, it's all about looking like the standard white male image mm -hmm. of what makes a good soldier. Um, right. And, and it's a similar concept that we see in, in professionalism. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, there's like this, there's kind of like a subconscious requirement of looking a certain professional way, even in the corporate structure, for sure. Definitely. So I feel like as soon as you don't do it, you know, as soon as I started speaking as a woman veteran, I came up with, you know, wearing the combat badge I earned myself on a pink thing I crocheted myself because it's like <laughs> immediately giving people this message. Like, I'm not that combat veteran that you're thinking of. Like, I'm not that person that's here to just like pump up the organization. I'm going to ask you to right. think critically. And this exactly. is why, like, I've spent so much time on this channel talking about our appearance and like how important it is to like act out and try things when you leave these high control groups. Mm -hmm. Did you like yeah. feel like you had a phase like that? I did. I did. Yeah. I mean, I like when I first left Christianity. Well, yeah, but probably like probably like two years ago, I went through a several month phase when I first left Christianity where I was feeling very rebellious. I didn't necessarily want to do anything uh, like against the law or that's just morally wrong. I wanted to flex my moral freedoms that weren't wrong, you know? So, um, like in order to stand against, I, I, I had been assist in the system of patriarchal thinking and myself as well. I had had, uh, Christianity, especially in the Torah, I had come to a place of agreement with patriarchal thinking because 
I was trying to follow Yahweh in the Old Testament and the patriarchs. And so when I had start, started having these light switches flipped and light bulbs pop on, and when I started changing my mind and relooking at everything, I knew that the first thing I needed to do was relook at my own sense of justice and morality and equity. And it's interesting because as I was leaving Christianity, I was also finishing my second um, a graduate degree in human resources. And during that time, I did a lot of study on diversity, um, equity, and inclusion, and a lot of case studies. And it, it was it was such a transformational period of my time, my life, where I realized that like, it almost, and it almost felt right and natural and freeing to just be like, whoa, I mean, literally, there's n literally no way, shape or form, uh, should men have such dominant control over the the lives of women in this in the sense that we do like i always i always understand like we're humans as part of as, as, as humans we're part of nature right so we're gonna we're gonna engage with each other the way uh nature engages with itself and it's very nuanced and diverse it's not the same across every species and culture and we're especially nuanced and diverse because we're so psychologically like complex but I mean, once I kind of was able to step back and say, no, like, there's literally nothing wrong and nothing unnatural about uh, homosexual uh, relationships or uh, desires or anything like that, or and especially when it came to like just feminist ideas. So, I, yeah, I, I, to get long story short, I painted my nails um, for a couple of months there and I would walk around wearing T-shirts that were like inflammatory with like upside down crosses and 666s on them. And I was just really wanted to just give the big F you to the system. You know what I mean? The system that had abused me my whole life and just say, look, if I'm going to stand with somebody, I'm going to stand for the marginalized people and the, the abused and the ignored and the damned. I'm not going to stand with you self-righteous hypocrites, you know, like, so I, yeah, I think that's a big part of like, it did affect me for a while. Over after time, I, went, I mean, I went and got both my hands tattooed right as soon as I left, got my neck tattooed as soon as I left. I've got a nose piercing, you know, um, I just wanted everyone to know that, like, I'm not part of your, um, your, you know, Christio fascist alt-right freaking, I don't want to go too far, but you know what I mean? I just wanted to know people to know that I'm not with, I'm not with that, you know? So over, over, over time, I realized that I actually prefer not to have my nails painted, not just because of maintenance and stuff, but it's just like, it's too much of a distraction for people for me online because of what i'm doing and what i'm trying to convey i'm actually trying to reach christians and i'm trying to reach Torah observant people especially because that's my niche and um it's so off-putting for them that i kind of pull a poll and say look maybe i should you know approach them in a way that's a little bit more reasonable to them so i try i, I for, for the sake of other people and not offending people when i'm trying to get them to listen to what i'm saying and not be distracted by what i'm wearing and what I, you know that's when I try and dull things down and just like, like, look, look, just listen to me, you know? But yeah, I, I do have periods where, and even in my private life where I walk around eccentric on, ten, on, on purpose, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I like that. Quirky. Um, I, you know, my whole story, I feel like was me, you know, I, I get dumped out of this cult at 15 and I don't know anything about the world. And I'm just like, I just need to try to fit in and, mm -hmm. you know, somehow just like wasp culture just seems like the easiest place for me to fit in. Um, right. And eventually one of the things I realized was like, I don't, you know, like me trying to fit in with white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America is just as foreign to me mm -hmm. as, you know, like, Rachel Dahl is all going and adapting another race, another culture, you know? So like, I need to dress myself in a way that says to people, like, I am not your white American Barbie doll, um, which yeah. is what I spent a really long time. You know, I basically say like working to be Barbie. By the way, did you know that the Pentagon partnered with Mattel from 1982 to 2000 to make Barbies, combat Barbies, and yes, I do have a chapter of my book called Combat Barbie. Um, That's right. They thought that women were not joining the military because it was seen as overly masculine. And what was the biggest fight about between the Pentagon and Mattel? The hairstyle. 
this Barbie specifically oh. her hair has gone all over the place. So I really like that she's very rebellious. Um, <laughs> this is also my first Barbie because of course cults. Um, but like the military, like the Pentagon was like, no, she has to have a bun, you know, like, and, and this argument about the bun is so loaded. And Mattel was like, we will not release a Barbie that cannot have her hair combed. Like, so they had to wow. kind of come up with this compromise, you know, of what wow. they had was like a military hairstyle. Anyways, I love that story. Um, That's crazy. By the way, this is my F-bomb. And usually <laughs> I offer a crocheted gift to anyone that comes on my channel. So I will be sending you your very own F-bomb. Yes, thank you. Holy crap, what a surprise. That's awesome. That's a pretty good uh, gift for someone with your yes. background. So uh, there was a couple things that you talked about that I wanted to point out, which one, I just think it's this shortcut for any like guru, con man, wannabe cult leader, which is when they offer you simple solutions or not even simple solutions, but just black and white solutions mm -hmm. to like really complex problems that humanity has struggled with. Like that's a sign. You know, mm -hmm. like this black and white thinking and somebody down there um, in the comments while you were talking said, you know, they used to say or they tell Mormons that ex Mormons leave the church to sin, but actually we leave the church and then there is no sin. Right. right? And I, you know, one of the ways I kind of explain organized religion and coercive religion to my daughter is just like. It's just, it, there's just so many rules about what you can and can't do. And then like when you've grown up that way, when you've experienced that all through your formative years, it's like, it's actually a part of societal development that we have to go through. Mm -hmm. um, I actually want, wrote this essay about how much, you know, cult survivors, military veterans and Prince Harry have in common because we all, you know, when we get out of these, organized groups, these total institutions, high demand groups, that really a part of what you are asked to do for success in these groups is tamp down your own individuality for the purpose of the group, for the mission, for the cause. Right. Doing that, it's going to like change your personality. And when you're being asked to do that under the age of 25, and especially under the age of six, it like mm. permanently impacts you. And so- right. You know, I think this part of being crazy um, with third culture kids, they call it delayed adolescence, when you have to like learn the culture and, and figure out and just like figure out who you are mm -hmm. um, really is super important. Um, yep. And also, you know, I always like to point out that going from high demand religion, you grew up in some sort of high demand Christianity, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then into the military mm -hmm. is actually like a very common path. Mm -hmm. And it tends to make us pretty successful as, you know, soldiers or Marines or whatever it is, because it's just like, right. oh, I'm used to this. Right. Like I've yeah. been in the army of God. Um, mm -hmm. Can you can you talk about that a little bit, like how it was and going from like the Christianity you grew up with then into the military and then kind of like what you did and what you started after that. Yeah. I mean, it, it like, there's a lot there, but I mean, I was raised in a primarily Presbyterian home, especially in high school, very reformed Calvinist thinking. And my dad was a Lieutenant Colonel in the air force. My mom had once been a Lieutenant in the air force also, but she got out when she got pregnant with me. I was her second child. There was five kids all together. I was the second oldest. I was the oldest boy. But um, so as I was getting to the through high school, I was really into like Navy SEAL stuff, pararescue jumper stuff. And like I liked watching like Black Hawk Down and The Patriot and um, Full Metal Jacket and, and these war movies. And I knew that my dad had a really strong sense of patriotism and he honored that very much. And that's why these movies were playing in our house. Um, What's the Saving Private Ryan and things like that. So I I felt very like drawn to the glory and honor of uh, being part of something that that's that's that meaningful, you know, um, that leaves such a big impact on the lives of other people. Um, 
I, I also, in a way, I, I I know now in hindsight that it's partially masochistic to an extent. Like I almost felt worthless at the time, and I wanted to make myself have worth by being willing to go sacrifice myself for other people. And so, when suffering, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, when nine eleven happened, I was um, I thought whatever it was, three months before I turned eighteen, and I was homeschooled. So when 9-11 happened, I actually uh, went ahead and finished all of my schoolwork for the rest of the year as fast as I could. And by February 12th of 2002, um, I joined the Marine Corps. So that was October, November, December, January, February. Yeah, five months after 9-11, I joined the Marine Corps. And so when I went in, they were, you know, um, the recruiters always try and assess the quality of different candidates and what they could potentially do or whatever. You take the ASVAB, you, you know, all this stuff. So I did that stuff and they're like, look, you should be in um, uh, crypto linguistics. We'll send you to DLI in California to learn a second language. By the way, all my siblings went on to do exactly that. Um, and I was just like, no, 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 no. That's some nerd stuff right there. Like I'm trying to go kick some doors in and, and slide down a helicopter rope or something and, you know, fight some bad guys, you know? And, uh, he's like, okay, well, if that's what you want to do, you know, they always need more infantry. And that's definitely like the war was just starting essentially. Well, we hadn't even, OIF one hadn't officially even begun yet, but they knew it was about to. Um, so I was one of those like eager zealot, zealous high school, kids who just felt a sense of patriotism and duty to go protect my country because of propaganda because of my like you said like narcissistic and hyper controlling upbringing where that was glorified and um honored so and you know I cults do. and high control religious systems also breed this sense of superiority and I feel like that makes it really easy to go from, you know, oh, I am God's chosen to, oh, I'm America's 1%. Um, yeah. I also really relate with that. I almost joined the Marines just because I thought it was the most badass um, yeah. in high school. And I, I, mm -hmm. I just like wanted to do the really hard thing. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up joining the army, like not really understanding the combat ban at all. Like I was flabbergasted that in 2009, it was legal to say a woman couldn't do something because of her gender. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I ended up in intelligence where I was really good at, but I was just like, I want to be infantry. I want to go, you know, yeah. like all of the, the things. Um, Ironically, mm -hmm. I later get to be, you know, with the infantry and like being one of the the first women integrated onto army teams. You Marines did uh, did beat us to it by six months. Uh, oh, really? You're cool. still not integrating your your initial training, so like. Um, right, right, right. But yeah. um, you know, I I have this scene in Uncultured where it is literally at basic training, and it is the celebration at the end of basic training, right? You go out, you do this long march, you've just had all this time in the field, like you feel really badass and like a real soldier and you come marching in and it is literally flags everywhere, sometimes fireworks, right? Lee Greenwood just blaring, I'm proud <laughs> to be American. Yeah. All of this kind of like, toxic patriotism really, really ramped up in the military after 9-11, um, you know, which is when you joined, I joined in 2009, which is the beginning of the surge to put 100,000 more troops in Afghanistan. And so it was very like real, like you're going to go, you're going to get in the shit. And I remember standing there and I didn't know the term for emotional invocation at the time, but I was like, oh, this is culty. This is like what cults and churches do to get you like ramped up and then everybody's crying and, you yeah. know, people are like belting out the lyrics and just right. like, it's this, it's this like getting your group high on the idea. You know, you had the suffering, you had the doing hard things together. And now you're kind of like getting high on the idea of dying for your cause. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. which of course is very similar to at least what they do in cults yeah it is it is it is it's like uh, the ultimate the ultimate reward would be to be a martyr essentially 
you know. So someone's saying here, you know, the sense of I only have worth if I give my life away in service is so common. Yeah. And, you know, my husband was a special operations helicopter pilot, the 160th. It's a big thing. And I asked him once, I was like, every, you know, high, high control, high demand group is about one thing. This was eventually turned into my concept of the sacred assumption. And I was like, what is it in the 160th? He said, oh, death in service of country. Like if you mm -hmm. retire alive, like you're second tier, you know, like, well, yeah. like what are you doing? You didn't die for your right. country. Or like one time he was asked if he wanted to go on a training flight in Afghanistan, unneeded. And he mm -hmm. was like, no, like, like, do you yeah. need me to train someone? No, we just don't know if you want to go. He was like, no. No, I, I don't want to go train in an active war zone for no reason. And yeah. these are the things that make you, you know, uncommitted to the team. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. You um, have to be completely willing to, like, just give it all at a drop of a hat at all times. Right. And it's also one of these things that gets us after we leave and in our deconstruction. And I wonder if you find this like somehow contributes to you going off and getting deeper into religion, which is, you know, especially when we grow up as children taught that we are going to die in mm -hmm. our in our teens and 20s as martyrs for God. Right. Which is what we were taught in the apocalyptic cult is what a lot of people and even regular evangelical Christianity are taught, right? Because you're growing up in a world of Jesus is coming back any day. Then you have, you know, as a young person joining the military during a war where you might die, like you're going to be on the front lines. Mm -hmm. um, and then you come home and all of a sudden you're not maybe going to die anymore. And it's like, there's some pretty good music, deconstruction music about this, that it's like, now I have to figure out how to live now that I know I want to be alive. Mm -hmm. Because we were really like prepared our whole lives to die. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. Like, do you like, do you think any part of that was a driver to to going deeper into religion or? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I totally. I, with that coming out. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that. Once I left the Battle of Fallujah in 2004, um, where like I, my company, Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, had 150-something people going in. We came out with less than 100. We had 53 critically injured and 13 KIA in a 46-day period where we were involved in almost 300 firefights and a lot of carnage. And so when I came back from that, I dealt with survivors' guilt um, and, and a host of different like PTSD symptoms that luckily for me weren't like violent. I, I, I was always able to remain um, sort of um, aware of, I never had flashbacks or, or terrible nightmares. I never like did anything crazy per se, but I didn't realize how much it had affected just my existential um, thinking and I would, I started, my, I started to develop a lot of ADHD habits and a sort of intrusive thoughts and uh, anger management issues. And so there were, there's so many different aspects of PTSD that can develop over time, especially when you first get back from something like that. But I know that from the day I got back from that battle and for the rest of my career, and even after I got out, but especially after I got out, I had sort of this ex existential crisis that was ongoing like every day. And um, I used to complain about it. Like I feel like I have a daily existential crisis, but especially got bad when I got out of the Marine Corps, because so long as I stayed in the Marine Corps, even after my worst combat that I was involved in, I was still around other people who understood my sacrifice and they understood my honors and my awards and my promotions and they understood my value. And, I, and even though I hated those regulations to some extent, and I hated the bad leadership and a lot of the you know, sold out culty stuff that goes on. And I wanted more individualism. Um, I also didn't appreciate at the time how much it uh, fed my identity as a human being that these people, this entire community of, you know, a million Marines, like, will stand behind me and say, I'm a good guy. I, I, you know, I've, I've earned things. I've made my way. I've earned their respect. I'm, you know, I'm brave and whatever. And I didn't know that once I left that environment and no one was telling me that anymore and no one cares anymore, 
Like literally no one cares. Like the only way people are going to ever have an idea of who I am and what I've been through is if I tell them. And when you tell people a lot of this stuff, they become, they think that you're like just attention seeking whore. They think you're uh, turning yourself into a martyr or you're selling something or whatever. And so a lot of people become afraid to actually share their real experiences. But my ex existential crisis really hit when I got out in 2015 and I started to try and like, like do this sort of like Derek Zoolander, like, who am I stuff? Like, who am I? You know? So I, um, in, in seeking that out, I resorted to what I had been indoctrinated with, which was the Bible. And I thought, well, if I'm going to figure out who I am and what's true and what's meaningful, what's, what's a meaningful way to live, like above all things, even if it means sacrificing everything, how should I live my life? And I ran to the Bible to find out the answers of that because I like since I was a kid, I thought that was the truth. So that's what kicked off my initial delve into theology. And I mean, I had already been studying it off and on my whole life through churches I was a part of. And I was just interested personally anyways in theology. But that's when I really just went ham and like bought all the books and started reading all the lexicons and reading all the commentaries and reading the books that weren't in there and just really diving into the history and sort of like falling in love with with the Bible in my own way uh, at that time. And so that's how I built up my initial following, teaching on Christian truthers on YouTube because of that existentialism. I was always trying to figure out how do we how do I make sure that when I die God will be like, you did good. You did it. You did the right thing. You did what you're supposed to do. How can I make sure that's going to happen? And every day I woke up for years, even, even as I was teaching the Bible, asking myself that question. So, yeah. And yeah. You know, what you gave us there was sort of a really good description of how radicalization can happen. Um, and, you know, you, you gave yourself a new mission, which was, I'm going to do this, you know, I'm going to know this, be this Bible scholar. And so often, I think that people misidentify what is really, really hard after leaving these groups. And they say, it feels like we're missing the camaraderie, we're missing the community. But what I more and more suspect it is, is we're jonesing for the mission. Yeah. Um, and it's that mission that gives you purpose. Right. And like speaking mm -hmm. of the military, you know, I mean, when I, I also had like a really bad deployment, we had like one single high casualty producing event that was really, really intense and just a deployment where I was learning and dealing with how many people I was going to indirectly be a part of unaliving and all of that stuff. Um, and then a decade later, you know, we are watching Kandahar and Kabul fall. And, you know, my husband and I didn't get out of our pajamas for two weeks. Um, and a big part of that was this sort of, you know, how are we going to be seen by the American population? And as well as the feeling of just like all of our sacrifices were for nothing, like mm -hmm. nothing. We just watched it all go right back. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely think we needed to get out of there, right? Like it was long overdue, yeah. um, but it, it was one of those struggles about like, if, if you know, suddenly if we no longer see American veterans as honorable, what is my identity now, right? Like what mm. is the, and this is something, you know, I struggled with because even when I was writing Uncultured, I still feel like I was very much kind of in the military cult a bit in way of thinking. And I didn't actually resign my commission till like six months before the book came out. And it was so hard for me to do even after eight years off active duty. Mm. And, you know, but as I went through writing it and publishing and, and doing all of this talking and teaching, you know, you start to really not want to it's the same as leaving a call like you don't want to call things by the whitewash names you don't want to like give mm -hmm. things more credibility but it's also like i just have a harder time sometimes identifying as a proud veteran because yeah. i've dug in so much to like the system and and how toxic it really is mm -hmm. yeah i mean that's, i i understand that because like when i got out of the marine corps i was so averse to being part of that system that i made it like i didn't attempt to get any benefits i've never tried to use 
any of the like VA claims services and stuff. I have, I did recently because I realized through counseling and <laughs> support that I need this stuff and I should have this stuff, this support and this, uh, um, what's the word? Disability. So I, it could, and for one, the, going through the process of finally admitting to myself, maybe I do need help and talking to a real psycho psychotherapist about it and having them say, look, dude, I've been talking to you. You did all these questionnaires and tests for me. Like you have PTSD. Like having someone tell me that even 20 years almost after the events that really triggered it, um, it's really helpful actually. Because you like, it yeah. helps you like understand the, some of the decisions that you have made and even in the last years that I didn't realize were so tr affected by that, you know? It's such an important part of our deconstruction. And so, you know, I will say like, I wrote a whole book about the parallels between the military and the cult, but it wasn't until I got out that you, I, I really saw the strongest parallels of the experience. Yeah. And, you know, one of the ways that we get human beings to stay motivated through really hard things is by telling them and ourselves, it's no big deal. Right. And veterans yeah. particularly are really bad at like the trauma ranking and like, oh, you didn't go through anything, you know, or like, yeah, what do you know about it? Yeah. I get all the time. How can you have PTSD? Women didn't even go to combat. Like, first of all, oh, did. second of all, why do you think that your PTSD from walking around waiting for an IED to get you and my PTSD from walking around waiting for one of you to get me is any less valid? Um, right. So, but for any veterans that are listening, I went through my disability about a year after I got out because I was pregnant. And then I got back like, like really bullshit low, made no sense. You know, I hadn't used the right words. Sometimes you don't know how you're supposed to talk about your disability until you see it. Right. So I was lazy for a while. And a year later, I went back through again, which, by the way, is the best way to do it. Don't appeal. Just wait a year and then file new information. Um, but service connected, I found out. But what the doctor said to me really struck, stuck with me. He was like, so you've been out for three years? And he goes, and I said, yeah. And he goes, yep, that's about how much time it takes. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I mean you're so in the military mindset of, you know, carry on, drink water, take a Motrin, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, that it, mm -hmm. it literally takes you about three years to just kind of deep, one, deprogram from that mindset of you're fine, and then mm -hmm. two, like, hang out with civilians who aren't nearly as broken as you are and actually mm -hmm. see, and this is, kind of the message I always want veterans to take from this is you are not taking money away from another veteran who's really needs it more. This is a settlement. The government decided how much each part of your body and your mental health is worth. And they're paying you the lowest they can possibly get away with paying you <laughs> for those things. So this is like yeah. a workers comp claim. And I went from 30% to 100% pretty easily. Um, and then I didn't have to have a full-time job because it comes with a paycheck, right? So yeah, like it really, right. can, when we are talking about healing and the totality of healing, like mm -hmm. give yourself permission to go to the VA and file a claim for the things that the military broke in you. Absolutely. And same, it's likewise with getting out of, uh, religion, essentially, or Christianity, especially like one of the first things I had to learn was self-love, self-care. And counseling and it's i know it doesn't come with like you know the type of benefits va stuff does but it it does come with the benefit of like you realizing that i didn't realize how much abuse i had endured just from relationships not from combat but from actual relationships in my life my ex-wife my father and etc and friendships i had and I allowed those relationships to exist, especially the relationships that were in churches and pastors and stuff like that, because of my like Christian belief. I allowed myself to continue to get walked on over and over again because of like the words of Jesus that if you don't forgive others and you won't be forgiven, that kind of stuff, you know. So when I came out of Christianity, I had to give myself permission just to be like, no, like I can say no to people. I can take time to do things I want to do for once. I can um, like enjoy life 
and not have to have some mission every single day, you know, and I can get help. I can talk to people about what I've been through and, and assess my actual health. And I think a lot of people don't do a lot of mental health assessments and inventory. Um, and even increase like you said about like the validation of somebody else being like, no, it was that bad. Like, you right, know, right. you absolutely can have PTSD from what you went through. Right. Absolutely. Well, and, and PTSD, and I'm sure you're aware and familiar with complex PTSD, CPSD, and that, and that that's the result of religious abuse and religious trauma and things like that can cause complex PTSD. Yeah. So there really is a lot of similarity there. That, and that's exactly right. And so this was, you know, my editor is the one that pulled, picked this out in Uncultured. So the basic training chapter, which is called Drink the Kool-Aid. Um, I forgot to mention the barrels and barrels of Kool-Aid called Victory Punch that were at the ceremony at the end of basic training. Mm. Um, but the chapter opens up and I am what seems like a soldier running through the woods. And as you read the dream, it's eventually it's us as children running from the Antichrist soldiers, like at, you know, seven, eight years old. This is what we're bringing programmed to do. Wow. And I always identified my complex PTSD trigger as being deployed and realizing all of a sudden I was behind walls that I couldn't leave about to be subject to a whole bunch of sexual violence that I identified that as my trigger, but my editor, you know, a decade later when we're writing the story is like, no, look, you're having flashbacks in basic training, mm -hmm. um, which I think another really important piece when we are talking about healing and when we are talking about both the military and religion is any system that requires to break you down, to build you back up, is traumatizing to you. Mm -hmm. So just going through basic training is traumatizing, right? For me, Absolutely. it was traumatizing enough to really trigger all of the complex PTSD from everything I'd already survived in the sex mm -hmm. cult. But like, not even to begin talking about what the training is, but just training in a high demand group, just being taught how to suppress your own individuality and desires is traumatic. And yeah. then we're training to kill people, right? We run right. around saying left foot, right foot, left foot, kill. And, mm -hmm. you know, all this extremely violent and or rapey imagery. And mm -hmm. like that is traumatizing. And that's all <laughs> before you ever set foot in a war zone. Oh, yeah. And, and boot camp at the Marine Corps boot camp, it's it probably the same with you guys. I don't know. But we don't we're not allowed to say um, I think my power just went out or something. <laughs> phone still works though we're not allowed to say uh i we any like personal pronouns we have to say this recruit and um to when you're talking to the drill instructors and you can't say like like they they wanted to go over there you had to say those recruits wanted to go to the head you know or these recruits are requesting permission to get water or this recruit is requesting permission to whatever and if you ever used a personal pronoun ever then you would be demolished for that. I mean, you'd be just made an example of like burpees until you throw up and then out to the sand pit to roll around in the sand. And then, you know, it's just like, it's you never language. They right. cut all your hair off and they take away your pronouns and they tell you that you are nothing. And they literally do tell you that you are name, nothing. Right. Cause most of us haven't gone by our last name. So they change your name. Right. right. You're now being That's called true. private so-and-so. Well, in the first, in the first, um, See, so our boot camp is 12 or 13 weeks, but for the first six weeks, you don't even have name tapes on your camis. So they won't even let you have that. So like, and, and they, they tell you repetitiously that you are worthless, completely worthless. Like that you are nothing, that you're just a piece of shit and you came from shit and you were worth shit before you got here, but that they are going to make you into something valuable and they are going to teach you how to be a real man, you know, or a real hero. And so, For yeah, the women, there's an even extra level. So I swear that the women so, drill sergeant's job is to look perfect every day, to smell mm -hmm. good, to have full makeup on, look like combat Barbie. And then they just tell us how gross we are, how disgusting we look. Right. You know, women, we're, we weren't allowed to wear makeup. Of course, we were also not allowed to pluck our eyebrows. 
And they literally went through the line, these women drill sergeants, and they were like, you're going to have a unibrow and you're going to have a unibrow. And if we see you using razors to edge them up, we'll take away all of your razors. So now you can't shave your legs. You're going to be standing there in PTs. It was really a part of like, oh, one of the ways you break women is by making them feel unattractive and and gross. Right. Um, in right. Ways that we like that's not a significant part for most men of their identity, so it's not as effective as the tool of of breaking the men. For me, like I want to say, one of the one of the worst breakdown efforts they did in the Marine Corps boot camp was a lot of homoerotic stuff, where they would make everyone in the squad bay. Uh, so we're all standing online, you know, we're facing each other across across from each other down this long corridor called a squad bay. That's where you stand while you're waiting for orders, you know, and the drill instructor walks up and down between the aisle, uh, between the, uh, down the squad bay aisle and just yells at everybody. Well, there's many different drill instructors there. But when we were doing showers, like getting into the shower and getting out of the shower, it was all done very like by the numbers, by the numbers, by the numbers. Like, and they wouldn't just let you get undressed and go get in the shower. It was, uh, you know, take your skibby shorts off right now. Okay, put your skibby shorts back on. Okay, take your skibby shorts off right now. Okay, put your skibby shorts back on. I right, do 10 burpees. And that was how, and you would like take one step forward, 10 steps backwards to do something just to fuck with you. And so when, and they knew that we hated being naked in front of each other, because that's your only sense of privacy and individuality you have left. If, if you're a boot camp, is like whatever's hidden physically. And so they take that away and they would get us completely naked and have us doing uh side straddle hops, you know, jumping jacks and uh, dips and all kinds of weird, like crab walks and stuff naked with uh, 90 other men in the room um for for a period by the way how the children of god programmed the children in the sex cult uh specifically the girls like we were any any form of covering your body was the sin of shyness so Mm. you know you're expected to always be changing and rooms full of people we lived in dorms like it was just like being in in basic training in the military Mm. growing up Mm. for me and any sort of attempt to cover yourself up this is also why underwear control is so important, but really important thing that you said here, and this can be an important part of deconstruction. Sometimes we don't realize things are sexual assault that are sexual assaults. Two categories of that is pants down spankings are sexual assaults, and a lot of military hazing is sexual assault. And so, you know, the the official numbers, um, the U.S. is the only English speaking Western nation that even took these numbers of how many men are sexually assaulted was one in six. Um, mm. And they expect that's only 20 percent of the reporting specifically right. because of the hazing. Right? right. Or like when my husband joined 160th hazing. Right. The new guys had to take out the trash and do all the shitty stuff. And they had a poll. And your num your name was at the bottom, and they called it the scrotum poll, which now makes it sexual harassment. Mm-hmm. Right? It, but like people don't put this together um, right. about all of that stuff, and I, I really, really think that one of the reasons for such strong resistance to the repeal of "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" was. You know, we used to call it gay chicken. The men are not going to be able to play gay chicken anymore um, because they don't actually know who's gay. But there was mm-hmm. this complete atmosphere of just male homoerotic behavior that was completely standard and normal in the military. And in my opinion, like a, a way used to break new people, you know, like you're going to have to deal with all of this stuff, doing jumping jacks naked. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, totally. The, the Marine Corps, you know, yeah, the Marine Corps is one of the most homoerotic cultures I've ever been a part of, for sure. Like, it, it's even after they repealed "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" or whatever, and we had openly gay Marines. We we actually appreciated it, I think, because when Marines became open about it, it made it easier for us to not play gay chicken with actual gay Marines, and it made it easier for the gay Marines to tell us they were gay and like. And then, you know, it's it's weird because I had like I had a lot of Marines that were that became friends of mine who were gay, like 20 something, literally. And I I came to find that like they would joke around with me about 
being attracted to me or something. And I found that if I was just like, oh, come on, dude, you know, you know, I don't play like that or whatever. Then they would just, it would just be a joke. Like, you know, I could tell them to stop being gay and they would just laugh ha, and then leave me alone. And we always had a relationship where they would like flirt with me in, in a way, I guess you could consider sexual harassment to an extent. So I did have, I did have dudes try and pull their, actually pull their junk out on me and ask me to uh, touch it before. Um, so I have been sexually harassed in the Marine Corps too, but it's, it's weird because that even the guys who are straight and married um, or they seem to be straight, and they're married and they are all about sleeping around and they love going to strip clubs and they love porn. And it's very obvious because no one's secretive about any of this in the military, obviously. They like share each other's like sex toys. It's so gross. Um, but I mean, dudes will have what's called hump, hump offs. And, and it's the joke is it's not gay if it's a dominance thing, you know? Like whoever's whoever can hump the other person into submission is just a more dominant gorilla. They're not they're not in the joke is it's not gay, it's dominance. And so Marines will do intentionally gay things even when they aren't gay. Just to I don't know, like it's a weird sense of humor. It gets to right. So rape is never about sex, rape is about power, right? So right, every right. And what you're talking about is power, right? The struggle yeah. for power. And when we come back to, I am known for saying that rule number one of good groups is don't rape the children. Mm -hmm. And um, people are like, well, that's so obvious. And I'm like, well, then why do we have so many examples? Oh, yeah. Right? Um, but then people will ask, genuinely ask, like, why? Like, why do these coercive leaders and groups, like, why is that where it always ends? Mm -hmm. And it's because, and this is probably a good segue for you to tell us about the cult you've been battling, um, but it's because it's the ultimate form of power, right? Like similar to like, if you can hold another military man down and hump him, you're powerful, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can, you know, Jeremy Spencer or Fleetwood Mac, just do what you want with children relatively openly and nobody is stopping you, mm -hmm. Bill Gothard, you have a lot of power. Right. And that's really what all of this is about. Right. And, and one of mm -hmm. the things that I found just in my own story that I always say, I'm like, if they did it in the cult and they did it in the military, then I know it's either about power and control or programming and influence. Like way mm -hmm. before I figured out everything about underwear and control, I was like, they checked our underwear in the cult. That's a really creepy part of the story everyone hates. But I put it in there because they check our underwear again in the military. And I know those things are connected. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it's about power. It is weird. Yeah, I've never noticed that before. And there's, it's really interesting because in boot camp, they issue you two different types of uh, underwear. They, they issue you, you like tidy whities and they issue you a jock strap. And the jock strap is so weird. Like no one in the modern world wears it I mean, maybe i'm sure, sure there's somebody who does but no one wears jock straps unless you're going to put a cup in or something usually right. so it's a really strange like thong looking thing it really is like it's the one they issue you is like wearing a thong it only covers your junk in the front and like go, your butt's completely exposed and that sometimes when we're getting dressed they would have us put on a jock strap instead of regular underwear before we go do something. And I never could make a correlation between when they were making us wear that and which activities we did, because we did those other activities in all yeah. other forms of clothing all the time. So I just wasn't yeah. so, weird. So like, there's a lot, um, the section in my book is gonna be called the undergarments of control, right? Because there's so much there, but there's a couple things that took me a while to figure out, which was one, if it's, if the mission is so important that even your underwear matters, it's important. Right, it's easy yeah. to take it seriously. It must Two be important. Is that pantyhose is a visible form of underwear, and that's why pantyhose mm. requirements so often come in. And finally, mm. and this was from thinking about like why does the military regulate underwear but then never actually inspect it? It's that mm. just having the regulation, just having the requirement, gives you the excuse to check. Right, yeah. in theory. Right. Any sergeant or officer that wants can just walk up to a private and be like, show me your underwear right now. Yeah, make but sure they're marked. Right, yeah. I want to check if it's in regulations. 
Right. Um, you know, this was a similar thing. I talked about the bun and how loaded it was, right? That when the military was requiring women to wear perfect buns, like mm -hmm. messy hair, that was all it took for someone to isolate you. It was like, your hair is out of regulations. Get in here. Yeah. And that, that's all they need. Isolation and an unequal power dynamic is all someone needs to sexually assault you. Um, so cool. But yeah, I think the the like the regulation making the requirement of checking OK was like a big realization for me. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. All of a sudden, nobody is asking questions about why Jeremy Spencer of Fleetwood Mac and a bunch of other 30 and 40 year old dudes are going around checking if six year old girls are wearing underwear at night, you know, because you're not supposed to be doing it. Um, which also leads me to a broader group behavior thing of any time you have regulations or legislations that are arbitrarily chosen and enforced, we almost always see them used to oppress demographics without power, mm -hmm. whether that's hair rules, you know, like the military had to actually retract or the army had to retract their 2014 regulation updates because they were so, so blatantly racist. Wow. They like outlaw every protective hairstyle for black women. Um, wow. And it was just like, it was so bad. They had to undo it. And that's how it goes. Goodness. That's crazy. I had no idea. That's nuts. So, um, well, I'm definitely supposed to be getting off already, but I do want to hear you tell us about this cult that you've been like battling, but also oh, sure. one of the videos you said you helped start it. So like, please give us the tea. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Well, I, I have like an hour and a half video. I said that's a sh it was hard to explain. It would have been like three hours. I condensed it. It's actually uh, just my commentary on a private meeting that this cult that I helped start recently had. And um, so a buddy of mine that I was in ministry with for several years back in 2017, 18, 19, he and I split ways uh, from working together. We used to do like a Friday night live streams. Uh, and have like 1,200 so or so people there every Friday night. And we would teach out of the Torah and teach out of the Old Testament and the, and the New Testament. And um, over time, like our beliefs started to clash. And I started noticing that there was like personality and moral failures, um, personality clashes and moral failures on Adam's part. And I decided like, I don't really trust this guy anymore. I think that he is making decisions based on what clicks he can get and not based on what's true. And I started to separate myself from him. And ultimately, I ended up becoming, you know, agnostic atheist. And so when I started teaching that, my my connection with that whole group dissipated, right? So I, they all unfollowed me, unsubscribed. Well, some of them still follow me anyways. It's kind of interesting. But um, so I had I was left to kind of rebuild a new uh, channel and a new you know, mission, so to speak, online, going a completely different direction. And we split ways. And after we split ways, he started an actual physical, um, I guess you could call a commune out on some land in Galena, Missouri, where they started to, people from all over the country were coming together in their airstreams and fifth wheels and whatnot and living on this rented piece of land to try and live according to the Torah and do the sacrifices and the feast days according to the Old Testament. But in and yeah, yeah, but out of their airstreams and fifth wheels and such. It was really interesting. So um, anyway, long story short, uh, it's been probably two or three years since I was involved with them. And I started getting all these sources of information from their crew. People from their, his, his cult literally start reaching out to me to tell me stuff about what's going on out there. And I'm not ever going to burn my sources, but there are like several. And some of them live there. To, some of them live really close to there. Some of them just visit sometimes because they have like, you know, probably 40 or 50 families living on this piece of land. And then they have an additional hundred or so families that would come in on Sabbath days and feast days and stuff to make, to have these big gatherings and stuff. Well, child sexual abuse had become rampant to the extent that kids were becoming sexualized by other, other pedophiles. Uh, non pedophiles were allowed into the congregation because they were repentant and because they like weren't like that anymore. And their kids were sexually active and sexualized from a very young age. But the kids had repented and weren't like that anymore, even though they're six and eight years old. 
And so this like series of events happened where these kids started sexually assaulting other children and then other children started sexually assaulting other children. And then it, it spiraled out of, to the extent like they also believe in polygyny. Up until recently, they were allowed to have multiple wives out there. Uh, it's not it's not legal in Missouri, but that according to their own sense of self-righteousness, it is legal. Um, and so uh, we had dudes out there who were like essentially trying to have sex with and groom 13 year old girls to be their wife, because according to the Torah, there's like no issue with that. Um, so it, it got to the point where there was so much different scandalous stuff going on that they had this big meeting to address some of the stuff. And Adam, the leader who used to be my best friend years ago now, he's admitting that he's a terrible leader, that he's stepping down, that he's basically leaving the congregation and leaving the, the area uh, because he was warned about this lady and her kids coming in and he let them come in anyways. And anyway, I'm just kind of responding to that because he's, he's minimizing the damage that was done. And he's also deflecting blame every which way he can. And he's also not telling the full story of what really happened. So since I have all these sources, I did an hour and a half commentary, breaking down everything he was saying and what happened in that video to add a, sh a lot more detail and context to like how bad it's gotten out there. And now Adam has left and the, that the land owner where they all lived has just kicked them all off the land like within the last week. So they all are scattering and trying to find a place to go. CPS has been informed and is like uh, interested in this. And the, one of my sources contacted the uh, Christian County uh, Sheriff's like chaplain and he's looking into it. So it's just, a yeah, it's been a lot. Like when I found out about it about a week ago, I just, I just became laser focused on how am I going to communicate what's really going on here? My biggest part in making the video was hopefully to convince the people who are out there and are watching this video. I can see their comments. They're watching it already. Hopefully to help them realize that they are in a cult and realize that they are proliferating, protecting, and condoning child sex abuse and helping them to realize that they need psychological help and professional help. Because as it stands, you can see in the video that the way they, the way they administer like discipline and repentance is just by beating the senseless crap out of this kid and making him sit in a chair for five days, a six-year-old. Like they have no idea how to make progress or how to prevent this in the future or how to like take steps. They just keep saying like it's demonic and they need to pray and they need to fast. And the mothers are standing up and saying, my kids aren't like that anymore. We cast it out in Jesus name and all this. And everyone's cheering, you know, and I was like, no, 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 no. And nobody's asking where it came from in the first place. Cause, yeah, exactly. Well, they're, all, they're they're all passing the blame. It's 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 crazy. So I just had to expose it for what it was, so I could hopefully help people escape that situation. So yeah, it's been nuts. Well, I mean, good job. And just overall, I would say, you know, as one of these children who grew up in this situation, whom nobody ever tried to help, you know, thank you for trying to help. Um, yeah specifically a really sad part of uncultured where we're hearing about waco right and like being mm -hmm. told all the horrible things that happened and one of my thoughts is yeah but somebody tried to come for them you know mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. often we are just left behind we are the most unpowerful people um and just mm -hmm. in general something that we notice about cult scholarship and the people that tell their stories is they often tend to be women and I think, you know, some of this is because, of course, the worst abuses happen with the women. But, you know, when I really mm -hmm. look at it, I see, you know, this what we're talking about, right? Abuse children, abuse other children. And mm -hmm. exactly. we, once we establish, you know, my book establishes that women and girls in the cult were taught to be submissive, which means if you are my brother or another boy in the cult, you are being programmed to be my predator, right? Mm -hmm. To be my oppressor. In the movie, Women Talking about the Amish, you know, they say this, like, the boys learned the lessons from the men really well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's so much harder for men who have been a part of this to speak out 
you know, I experienced this a little bit with the military where once you define a system as toxic, if you realize you were successful in that system, that means you benefited from the toxic system. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, like, thank you for being a person that is willing to explore this and sort of explore your part, right, in upholding the patriarchy um, and really what it was about you that drove you there. Um, I hope you are writing a book. I think Bullet Holes in the Bible would be a great book. Uh, oh, actually. I, I, I really need to. I've written a lot of chunks of my life. I need to start piecing them together and really put something out. Because the story the story about combat is crazy and the story about my religious deconstruction is crazy too. So I think I'd, yeah, I'd like to. I really should. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, something that a psychiatrist said to me was, well, two important things. Nobody reads your story, they read their story. Um, and then also we study the extremes to understand everyone else. You know, mm -hmm. so people that have been in these extreme forms of religion, you know, I say one of the benefits of my story is it's a very obvious cult, but then when people right. read it, don't realize they were in cults or high control mm -hmm. groups they do realize they were in that exact situation before you know or they, mm -hmm. they do know like that line that speaks to them mm -hmm. um and especially you know when we talk about radicalization and when we talk about like getting like pulling down some of these systems of patriarchy that are really toxic um, you know, the best way I've heard it said is women couldn't vote themselves the right to vote. You know, ultimately what we have to do is radicalize the good men who mm -hmm. then can turn around and pull down the systems. You know, right. when, if you write a book about, yes, the stuff you learned, the, the combat stuff, but a deeper look at that, like mm -hmm. breaking that down and comparing that to religion and deconstruction, like so many more people will hear that message from you than they would from me. Um, right, right, right. So that's the, you know, that that's the hope. Yeah. That if I can be of any help on that process, you know, happy to connect and talk about oh, um, yeah. sometime. Because, um, you know, that's how we all deconstruct is like reading and hearing other people's stories. So that's true. Part of that that's process so true. Is really cool. Um, well, thank you. I'm sure I'll be looking for you. Have a large enough platform that you could probably interest publishers. So that'd be cool. That'd be really cool. Oh, uh, Joe, Joe's saying she pre-ordered the book if she could. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. My buddy Roops in here. My buddy from Combat, actually from Fallujah, is actually in the chat right now. His name's uh, Cut Up Garage, and he was actually in that battle with me. So I haven't seen him on TikTok before. So I just, just want to say hi. What's up, Roop? And yeah, and on that note, as someone says, promote your book, I am going to give a little promotion to my book. So I wrote Uncultured, which parallels my experience growing up in the sex cult and in the U.S. Army. You can read it in hard copy, you can read it in digital, and you can read it in audio, which the New York Times says is awesome. But is. also, first I'm going to say, always be skeptical of someone who tells you a problem and then sells you their solution. However... <laughs> What we know, one of the things we know about uh, coercive control, especially in a group context, is that the easiest way to recognize it is if you recognize it in a parallel context. So the paperback of Uncultured is for pre-sale right now. Pre-sale orders are really important in the cult of publishing, but I am telling it to people as if you have that person in your life that needs a little nudge to question the groups that they are in, or anybody that loved the movie Sound of Freedom. This will be a great, you know, the paperback, you can order it right now, it's 20 bucks, fire and forget, wherever you order books from, it'll get to your house on November 7th. And you don't even have to tell them what it's about. You can be like, this is a story of this little girl who was trafficked around the world, and then she became a captain in the army, and the book will do the work for you. And you know, cool. the whole kind of idea of the book was, it's such an extreme comparison, Mm -hmm. that you think I'm not going to be able to make it. And then when I make yeah. it really hard, you're like, oh, crap, uh, what else is culty? I know, yeah. So. so true. I love that. That's great. Yeah. And of course, please come follow me. Please go follow Justin. Um, really great content. You're you're one of my favorite creators. I always love Oh, thank you. Stuff. And I'm really you. glad that we got to do this.
Me too. I'm happy to hang out with you anytime. And uh, I will be talking to you about that book for sure. So and yes, we will get together. Oh, yes. and I'll be sending you your F-bomb. I'll have to make one first. Um, maybe I'll do that live because I was teaching people how to make it. So Sick. Right. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. It was great talking to you. Yeah.